Aloha and good evening, everyone. A pleasure to have you join us tonight. It's Tuesday night, time for tuning up with Iggy and Dave. No, we did not discuss our dress attire for tonight. It was just uh, pure instinct, Dave. But you look wonderful. So do you. <laughs> Great minds think alike. So we had um, <laughs> a, a week uh, to do what, Dave? A week to prepare for the rest of the Sheraton Starlight series at the Waikiki Shell. We have four more weeks and suddenly we're able to have 2,700 people in the 8,000 seat venue. So we have been busy selling tickets, especially for Led Zeppelin on August 6th and Queen on August 7th, and also for the performances upcoming this weekend, uh, a collaboration we're doing with the Liliuokalani Trust, music for and by the Queen, uh, with an all-star lineup of just about every Hawaiian musician that... Barbara uh, Casimero, Raya Teahelm, Moon Kakahi. Yeah. That will be the weekend of July 2nd, 3rd, and 4th, which will be followed by... The next week is West Side Story and More, and that is with Sarah Hicks conducting uh, with one of our Nahoku Opio Young Stars winners, Sophia Stark, uh, singing two selections, uh, and also will be joined by Makana, and I think a surprise, it's not a surprise, because I'm gonna tell you, a surprise visit by one of our Tuning Up guests, Jeff Peterson, hmm. will be joining as well. And how are dear birds doing at the show these days? They're departing. They're departing. Um, I, as you might have noticed, that uh, there's been more covering uh, on the shell. It reminds me of this uh, artist, Christo. I think he passed away uh, not too long ago. He's, uh, he was about 84. And he, um, what he's known for is to wrap huge monuments or even like islands. Uh, and I think he, he, he wrapped a whole bridge in Paris. And, and other places, so maybe he should have wrapped the whole shell. <laughs> I don't know. That's, that's, I'm so glad that it made you think of uh, some contemporary art. I think that's a, a great uh, segue. I personally, <laughs> looked like the farmer's market, um, or perhaps Kailua Beach. Um, was, was what I saw, but we've been making steps and you know, the priority is making sure our musicians are comfortable and they're safe and they can uh, play their instruments and, and we can, the, the most important thing is the music. And we well, thank you very that. much Dave for uh, taking care of so many things, wearing so many hats and I don't know, I know this is not the, the, the most uh, pleasant uh, item to take care of on your agenda, but uh, thank you for taking time. Well, on to more important things. Uh, we've t gone far too long without introducing our guest. That's this right. <laughs> Very special guest tonight. Um, I've known her. Um, she was one of the very first students mm -hmm. that I met uh, when I first came to Hawaii. And there's a, a thread that goes uh, all the way to to Dave Moss. Um, so we're very pleased to welcome Leilehua Lenzi Lotti. You're a performing artist, a recording artist, a fantastic viola player. You're a, um, um, a writer, a composer. You're also director of community engagement for Hawaii Contemporary. Uh, Leilehua, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Iggy. <laughs> and welcome to Hawaii, if I may say so. <laughs> uh, you recently relocated back here. Yeah, about a month and a half ago. Um, so I've been gone for almost 20 years, which is about how long I've known you. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Never did I think when we first met I would be welcoming you back to the place you grew up. So uh, it's been a, a real pleasure. But uh, so what brought you back? Uh, I'm so grateful in this time when a lot of people have had a really hard time with jobs and, and uh, you know, through, throughout the pandemic that there's been a lot of hardship here in Hawaii with people losing jobs with the tourist industry and of course our, our musicians and um, people being out of work. Um, that's just kind of a, a miracle and I feel so grateful to be working with this team at um, Hawaii Contemporary, um, as, as Iggy mentioned. Uh, and I just really believe in the vision of the executive director, Catherine Don, who's uh, originally from Maui and has had a huge career in Asia and has a really cool vision for the organization. And so I just thought it was a great um, opportunity to come back. And I think time away, I felt like 
I wanted to be doing something more concrete in the community and it's been a really cool opportunity to meet all these people that I wouldn't have necessarily met immediately who are in you know in it doing the real work um, so I'm, I'm very grateful to have that job to come back um, and have some stability as as the and as we know too well as musicians in this time <laughs> And uh, a, a position where you can certainly have a great impact on on the local arts and culture scene here. And um, I think we're all very lucky to have you in that position, uh, all of the organizations here. So um, I, I'm, I, get to a, I get to ask really simple questions. What's a triennial? That's a great question, Thank Dave. You. Uh, a triennial um, just refers partially to the kind of event, it's a festival. And the first part of it, the triennial part of it, means it happens every three years. So next year, in 2022, we're having an 11 year, 11, 11 year, 11 week event um, that we'll be able to announce more about in the fall uh, with artists from all over the Pacific um, and local artists uh, uh, really celebrating place in a lot of our local venues. Um, and uh, that is really, really exciting to be a part of. And I think so much as a lot of our craft and kind of some of the way I met you too is, you know, a lot, a lot of what we do is so isolated. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I love teaching and I love interacting with people. And so to be in a position where I, I can be doing that concretely and learning from people who do it in other industries is really exciting to then be able to plug it in in a meaningful way in my musical projects because I think you know it's uh, often sometimes I think big organizations and we see organizations struggling with this right now with different issues uh, try to kind of strong arm the way they're used to working in music and push a kind of social change or engage the community in different ways that that don't necessarily make sense for that community and so to be able to work with people who are doing that within communities all the time and watch how they're working and see what they're doing and then work with them and then learn from that and incorporate that into projects um, feels like a really exciting thing and, and really relevant and important right now so Absolutely. I, um, I think that that ch change of culture, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's so much, uh, you know, I'm going to say the buzzword here, but there's so much talk about cancel culture. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that there is so much opportunity for change culture right now, mm -hmm. where we can change the narratives of what's going on and we can use arts and culture and we can use music and we can use art and to in you know to really inspire uh, a community to change uh, for the for the better and I was uh, just just today I was I was talking uh, with our, our program committee for the symphony next year and we have a string of performances that'll actually be right here at the Hawaii theater uh, that sort of align with some of uh, when the triennial will be taking place and can you can you talk just a little bit about the theme the idea of the triennial it's something that in our programming today um, you know I was uh, in in my message that was going out trying to inspire them because the message of 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 this idea uh, that the curators are working from, I think is very inspirational. Yeah, and that was part of being excited about coming back. So the, the theme of the triennial is Pacific Century and uh, the, the Hawaiian version of the theme that's also a part of the title is Eho'omau no Moana Nui Akea. And breaking that down, if, if you don't know about vehevehe.org, it's an amazing online Hawaiian dictionary. Um, you can look up Ho'omau or Mao, um, which has a lot of really beautiful different meanings, um, but uh, renew or a, it, it's a it's a it's a really deep complex word that I don't want to oversimplify by translating. Um, and then uh, Moana Nui Akea refers to uh, the Pacific Ocean, um, but Moana, right? Everybody loves Moana, right? She's named after the ocean. Um, and Akea is often thought of as refers to Wakea, which is one of the original uh, gods in, in Hawaiian uh, Mo'olelo. So 
it's a it's a it's a powerful name also for the Pacific Ocean, and it's meaningful for, for the team also that there is Hawaiian in the title. It's the first time in the organization's history that there's Hawaiian in the title, um, and and we've been talking about that just the the depth of the language and and place, and so um, yeah, it's not about there being a a kind of looking backwards or looking forwards, but being present and being a part of what, um, I was talking to Aaron Salah about this today. Um, it's not that about reclaiming necessary, but necessarily, but illuminating these things that have survived and that are always here. Um, and so absolutely, I think it's a, you know, it's really visionary of them to, to hire somebody who's not in the visual arts world. <laughs> and, um, and to also be uh, thinking about it in, in such a broad way and to be uh, focusing one person, one entire full-time person and a very small staff on uh, you know, community engagement, which is education and public programming, but through a more decolonial lens. Um, and you know, as far as I'm concerned, in, in, you know, celebrating the Pacific, anything in Hawaii is celebrating the Pacific, but so much of what the symphony has been doing um, is so exciting <laughs> um, to be seeing and a part of that and feels like it fits in so much with the importance of place and um, precedence. And I, this is something I was thinking about with some of the programming, but growing up here and you know having somebody like Iggy as the concert master it was just, it was, it was normal to see somebody like Iggy, who was the concert master, you know, and it was normal that, you know, like the, the queen, Mumi Ukalani, is a composer, mm -hmm. and it was normal that there we had this really diverse orchestra of people. My first violin teacher was a Japanese woman, you know, and, and you just didn't think Hiroko about Primrose. it. Sorry? Hiroko Primrose? Yeah. And just, you know, there, the, it was, there was so much precedent of the possibility of seeing people like yourself in these positions that were a really, really excellent. And I don't think that that's something that's always possible for uh, a wide community of people in classical music. And so we have that possibility here in Hawaii. It's so special. And I think that's why it's really fantastic what the symphony has been doing and the possibilities of what the triennial can do. And, before we ask the question um, that <laughs> gets us back to how all three of us are weaved together here, um, spanning 20, 35 years or so, um, speaking on this topic, I, this past, the past two weeks, uh, the League of American Orchestras Conference was taking place uh, virtually. Um, it was digitally taking place. It was, it was actually not <laughs> literally. It was literally taking place virtually. Um, but anyways, Mari Yoshihara, who has been a guest on here and who is a wonderful supporter of the symphony, uh, was on a, a panel talking about racial diversity within uh, the orchestras. And I believe it's on YouTube. Um, I'd highly recommend anyone interested in that to, to go take a look at this. We can throw the link up um, as, as we uh, do on, on after the performance here or after the show here tonight. Um, but it's, it's a really important topic to discuss right now. And I think it's really interesting to have someone like Mari, who's so well spoken about this, be able to reflect what we're doing here in the orchestra, which has been, you know, it's been this way, but there's still more work to be done. And, and I think that's really important for us to recognize and to, uh, to communicate going forward. So thank you, Mari, uh, if you're watching for your amazing support and uh, ability to tell this important story about our industry. So. I believe, um, was she there with Jennifer Coe, a yeah. violinist, and, and Jennifer Coe is a fantastic violinist uh, who's been a, a guest artist of the Hawaii Symphony. Um, um, Leilihua, so you mentioned that um, you work for Hawaii Contemporary, visual arts, fine arts, actually everything, and, but you grew up as a, as a musician. Um, let me ask you a very simple question, and I'm so glad that I'm the one asking the question. Uh, what is art to you? I mean, like, okay, Picasso said something like, art is a lie that makes us uh, closer to the truth. Um, and there's a, a German movie director, Donner Smark, who said something like, art has, m art makes people change the way to see the world. Um, having your hands in so many art forms, what is art to you? 
I think a, a big thing I've been thinking about um, through my own work and in this new position um, is that art is a, a chance for us to practice empathy. Um, and I, that's I, in a bunch of different ways. We have this really special thing that we do as musicians where everybody, especially now, um, my day. I feel, I feel like an old lady saying this, but um, how often do people come together and just listen to one thing all at the same time for 90 minutes? You know, I, it, it's, it's so unique now. It's more and more unique that that's something that people would do to all sit together and listen. And it's not that they're thinking the same thing, but they're all in that space and maybe they're, you know, they're sitting and they're listening to this composer they've never heard of, maybe uh, Michael Fumai, and, and um, they're, if they're not used to contemporary music, they're experiencing the chance of seeing the way that this p person who's living, who they get to see in the audience, is experiencing the world and try to process that and have it change the way that they are experiencing the concert. And they get to practice that with these different voices uh, with Florence Price, which is so cool to hear that live, finally. Um, you know, that's, a, that's something that is really special about what we do. And they're practicing that empathy with how they experience the piece. But then afterwards, maybe they're talking to each other and they're they're talking about their experiences of the piece and then they get to practice that empathy with people maybe they don't know or with their relatives that they wouldn't have talked to in that way. Um, and so similarly with, with visual art, with, you know, in music we have time-based uh, art more consistently where um, it's only by using our memory that we can kind of think about form, which is another interesting way of thinking about something that we're doing to practice empathy. Um, but in visual art, to share that space and pause together and then practice that by different experiences of this, of this physical art um, is another interesting way to, to think about that. So I, anyway, it's a very long answer. Oh, <laughs> so practice empathy, do you feel that, I mean, is it cultivated or is it trained? Because not everyone who goes to a concert or, or see a painting at a museum will be able to grasp some of your concept. Um, do you think it started at an early age or, or is, is it instinctual? I think it's always something, I mean, the, the world is always changing and there's always, you know, kind of different ways that people are dealing with the issues that are going on, even if they, if they come in cycles. And so I, I think that's an, an interesting way to kind of, even if it's something that you think you have an opinion about, to revisit it. And I, there's certainly things that I've gone to see in, you know, when I used to live in New York and I'd go to some show with my best friend who was so into this composer and I would totally hate the thing that we went to see. But then I found that a year later we were still walking around in the park arguing about it or talking about it. And I realized that actually there was this thing in this piece that I hated that was so powerful and evoked this emotion from me that it was interesting. And so, you know, I also think that about that with my students too, that maybe a, a first step about that is what didn't you like? Can you articulate what you didn't like about it? You know, and even that is something that I think we don't always get to practice. Like how can you articulate really clearly what is upsetting you? Um, that's another way that, that, that that's an opportunity that something that we don't take personally, but. Yeah. Articulate using words or using music or using your own medium? Uh, both. I think if they, you know, if it's my, my friend used to give me a hard time and say, well, if you hated that so much, you should write something, you know, like write what you want to hear, <laughs> <laughs> um, which is a, you know, a, a, a great, um, I think, Eliane Radige quote that she's, uh, you know, I, there was a music I wanted to hear and so I had to make it, um, which is, she's one of my favorite sound artists, composers, um, but you know, then, then also just if it's not somebody who's creating um, to, yeah, to be able to articulate that and discuss it and then how that moves things forward in a way that's not, you know, politics or, um, or social issues that are often, it's harder for people to not get emotional about those things or to, or to talk through them in a way that's, um, that's empathetic or 
that is thinking about change. Um, and so art is a little bit more amorphous in some ways, and it gives us this space to, to try that out and see how that could move us forward. <laughs> So instead of moving us forward, I'm going to move us back um, because the question that I start every show with um, <laughs> is take us back to the very beginning and we let you decide where that begins. Um, you know, first Suzuki teacher, wherever you'd like. Um, sure. I Yeah, I think... Well, I think the very beginning was having, uh, you know, parents who would, were really playful with things in the house and music and, you know, played guitars and both wrote songs and both, you know, had a, a playful approach to music. And there's a, you know, just as much photos of my mom, you know, juggling as, you know, like sitting me on her lap playing piano as, you know, building stuff with my dad or singing with my dad, you know, so I think it was a part of this like greater play. And so then coming into, Immersion. yeah, being immersed in that. Um, so that was my approach when I met Hiroko. I was, you know, <laughs> eight years uh, old. <laughs> sorry, before we get, we, we get to Hiroko Primoz, oh, yeah. I, I believe your parents are tuning in. So <laughs> hi, Luis, hi, Salvatore. <laughs> <Mr. laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, then, you you one of your first uh, source of inspiration is the is the famous and, and great educator Hiroko Primrose. And um, yeah, she happened to move to Hawaii when I was in I think second grade, um, and so I I wanted to go meet her. But you know, at that point, I was still wearing you know bright blue bike shorts and like climbing tr the banyan trees and never wearing shoes and so I you know and music is about play so I went to my first lesson mm -hmm. you know having probably just climbed a banyan tree with no shoes on and came in and and uh and she kind of looked at me and she went you're too old but I'll take you anyway and I was just a little eight-year-old. I was like, how am I too old? Um, but, you know, she was really formal. We bowed at the beginning and end of all our lessons, and, and she was really traditional with Suzuki. And, um, and she's the one, she's the one that suggested that I, that I also start playing viola because her husband was a really wonderful violist. Yeah, William um, Primrose, who played a lot with Yehudi Minway. So... Um, so I, I was always saying that I hated the E string. And so eventually she said, well, why don't you think there's this other instrument? Why don't you think about playing the viola? Um, and I remember the first time I picked up a viola for fifth grade orchestra and played it and, and played the C string and just felt the way it felt in my body and just kind of immediately. It was just probably this terrible school instrument or something. I mean, they're not so bad out there, but um, that was it for me. It's just kind of the feeling of it that was so different. Um, like Mr. Moss over here. So um, I, I mentioned that um, when I first got to Hawaii, uh, you were one of the first students um, who I met. And um, you know, sometimes when you come from outside and I came, I was trained in France and then Indiana University. And I thought, okay, here I am in Hawaii. I'm gonna show how it's done. Um, and, and then I, I, I land here and I hear uh, you play as a solo player. I, I hear you play as a quartet. And, and that's when I realized, wow, I have a lot to learn myself about the authenticity of young students performing and training and listening to their teachers. So that was a very humbling experience to just uh, discover how wonderful uh, education and arts and music uh, was here. I remember, you know, you, um, Matthew Lamb, David Tam, or uh, <laughs> you, 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 your string quartet <laughs> partners. And I remember um, we would uh, meet at school, of course, but there were times when we met uh, at your place, mm -hmm. you know, just a couple blocks away from, from the school. And, uh, and, and there was a kind of a, uh, a telling moment when, when, I, when, I, when I heard you play. Um, that generation of, uh, of you uh, in the late 90s um, is, is wonderful. So, yeah, thank you for 
enlightening me, no. not just today, but uh, <laughs> 20 some years ago. No, it was, I was thinking about one of those, the, the first times we had a class with you because um, there was, we were playing board in and, um, and so we had this, this session with Iggy and he's, I forget what you were talking about, but he was trying to help us play board in, in a, you know, in a, the phrasing and he said something about this phrase and he said it needs to have more, you know, it's a je ne sais quoi. And my mom who speaks French, we all, the four of us looked at her like, please help us. What does that mean? And she said, I don't know. <laughs> of course we were. First. You know, what, what's very yeah. interesting too is, so I studied the boarding quartet um, at Indiana with uh, Dubinsky, who himself uh, founded uh, the boarding trio yeah. or the, the Russian conservatory. Uh, so there's a generation gap, not directly from boarding, but boarding had some students who then taught Dubinsky, uh, and I was taught by Dubinsky at Indiana, and then I taught boarding to you. So we had sort of a lineage from uh, Moscow or, you know, back to, to Indiana. So I think that's what we're here for as educators, kind of ensure the, the legacy and carry on. I think it's a wonderful, um, you know, story that, that we can share on mm -hmm. too. Um, so before we get to you and Dave, there are a couple uh, uh, phases, but uh, maybe Dave, um, is it time to introduce our... Well, this would be a halfway through the show. It would be a good time to tell people that they can text in questions <laughs> or comments, uh, and uh, you can text that to the number on the screen below here. Uh, and uh, we'll get those and we'll answer those. And uh, we have a, a quiz question this evening. Uh, a, a huge thank you to Hosser Wines for your sponsorship. Um, uh, tonight we have, what, what do we have, Iggy? We have Résonance, which is a Pinot Noir wine um, from the Willamette Valley, Southern Oregon, which I know very well because I go there, there's a music festival there. So my wife and I have been there many times. Um, but they spell it Résonance. I believe there's an accent aigu above the E of the Résonance. Kudos. So our winner this evening with the correct answer, uh, we'll get a bottle of that wine. Um, and we, were, we started the show by, by talking about the unfortunate uh, fashion incident of this evening, the dark pants and linen pastels uh, that the uh, two of us... Uh, the two boys are wearing? Yes. Um, and, 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 and so we went that direction. Um, so what is, our, what is our question this evening? Our quiz question is... Who is my favorite Hawaiian designer? And there you may are be featuring the designer. A big clue on stage. <laughs> and another really interesting cultural story. Uh, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. We, we'll tell we'll, we'll a little tell, more later you know, as we. Because there's lots of cultural <laughs> stories when it comes to designers, but this one is particularly um, interesting. So, Leili Hua. Um, so I've known you, you were in, uh, at Punahou as a high school student. Mm -hmm. um, tell us how we get to Dave. <laughs> so I decided to go to uh, Oberlin um, College and, and Conservatory. It's one of the only places in the country that you can really seriously do a double degree. Um, and I started as a double degree in uh, East Asian Studies and Viola. Mm. And um, I was playing in a quartet when I was there, and as I remember this, although I know you I remember meeting me earlier. sooner, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but I think how we became friends yeah. was that I had been playing in this quartet for a couple of years Oberlin. at Oberlin, and then when I was a junior and Dave came in as a freshman, I ended up leaving the quartet because I was doing other stuff and I was replaced, which, by the way, this quartet is still, still playing together. Wonderful string quartet that, that's doing mostly period yep. quartet work. Um, yeah, the Diderot uh, Quartet. So I had left and Dave came in and um, what would have been our quiz question, <laughs> they said, oh my gosh, our new violist has the same birthday as you. <laughs> 
And we were in the same studio studying with uh, Peter Slowick, who we incidentally, uh, both our principal violist and Anna Womack um, both, also studied with. Both guests on the show previously. <laughs> uh, um, comments about the number of violists we've had as well. <laughs> Um, and so then we, we met kind of because of being the, the two people that had been in that quartet and that was kind of it. And then we were, we were very close friends mm -hmm. for the, for the duration, the duration. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So we only overlapped for two years, but I came back for your senior recital. Mm -hmm. Um, and so after Oberlin, you went east. After Oberlin, I was at... Although east-west, yeah. you know, what is east, what do you want, right? <laughs> I kept moving away from home, is that, yeah. Um, I went to uh, Yale, uh, where our, our young, the young artist who I saw the other night, who was wonderful. Oh, Erin. Um, mm -hmm. Erin, um, which congratulations to her. Yes, and, and I have another former student who also plays viola from when I went to Yale in mm -hmm. Queenie. Anyway, let's, uh, yes. Um, so I, I, uh, I went to Yale for my master's um, to study with Jesse Levine, um, was in his last full class, which was really, really lucky. Um, and then uh, was in New World Symphony for a year, um, kind of at the encouragement of, of Mark Buten, who was also in New World Symphony. Um, and then, uh, went and studied in uh, in Germany with this incredible violist, uh, Wilfried Strela, who was, was one of the principal violists of the Berlin Phil, um, who kind of said, you know, I, I already had a master's. And so he said, well, just show up, you know, if you show up, I'll teach you. <laughs> so um, I quit New World and showed up, and I got lucky and got a position as a fellowship violist in the RSB, the Rundfunk Symphony Orchestra Berlin, for two years, and I studied with Wilfried. And then I decided to come back to the States um, to do a doctorate at Manhattan School of Music. Um, and then at overlapping the end of that was teaching at NYU, um, and then was teaching out in Colorado at uh, University of Northern Colorado. Well, so you're telling us um, all those wonderful places you've been and, and, <laughs> and learning the viola, but there's so much more about you, your creativity, uh, your compositions, and, and your um, experiments uh, in, in all those creative outlets. Did you always have them, or was there a point where you kind of got a grasp of it and that you thought to yourself, well, maybe I want to branch out and discover more. I mean, which leads me to another question. You're from Hawaii. Where do people go like, oh, she's from Hawaii. Um, I'm going to teach her this and that. And where did you become where, oh, she's from Hawaii. There's a lot that I could learn from her because oh. of so much, so many things that you, you have. Um, I guess the, the easy question is like, <laughs> oh, you're from Hawaii, you know, you, you know, or, you, or the palm tree swaying or <laughs> things like that. Where, it was more where of that. that become? Yeah, it was, it was much more of that. It was more of, um, um, oh, you're from Hawaii, you know, Hawaiians are lazy. You must, you know, like we need to make sure that you are working harder, which, which was really... You mean a, a peers, teachers? Or? Teachers. Teachers. Which was really toxic for, uh, well, the two of you know me, <laughs> which was really toxic for me um, as somebody who works hard. Um, Absolutely. To, to feel like that was, the, that was not the right feedback to be getting. Um, it's a label. And so um, I think there was a lot more of that and um, yeah, one of my friends was just saying yesterday, just, oh man, if I was, you know, if I was from, from here, I would, I would, you know, be talking about this all the time, you know, and I think I just kind of learned not to talk about it um, for a long time. And moving back here, I think is a part of, 
no, maybe there's something more to be done within this community and, and to embrace that more instead of not talking about it. Um, but I, I do also want to say I, I, you know, I do have really great friends that I have been able to talk to, like Jennifer Coe, who's you know, an incredible advocate yes. and has such a clear way of talking about these things. Um, to just mention one, because you mentioned her, but you know, I think seeing some of those people being able to articulate those things who are you know, um, going through different experiences and then also just kind of plugging into different communities um, and kind of finding that courage in different ways was important because I think that that, um, you know, you only, I, it, it's even funny right now, I hear myself being home, hearing right now, I can hear how much I changed, how I talked even when I moved. Um, and, and so it's, there's a lot of layers of that. And I think um, I really value things like being able to work in Germany for a couple of years. That was really, really incredible. And um, I also am happy to be home. <laughs> so, so like who or what gave you the strength and courage and inspiration to, to go into compositions and writing all those uh, other athletes besides just playing um, the, the viola wonderfully? Oh, thanks. Um, I was hanging out with a bunch of composers in grad school and took classes with uh, Martin Bresnik, who's still a really um, wonderful mentor, um, wonderful, wonderful teacher. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that they just kind of had, had people like him who encouraged me, who, or who just kind of saw that I was creative and interested in doing more than just, than just one thing. Um, and encourage that. Even even Jesse, actually, when I was going to go to New World, which is an incredible opportunity, and he he said, you know, this is a great opportunity, but like make sure that you also like have your voice. You know, like orchestral playing is a is a very specific thing. Um, but you know, like all of our musicians in the symphony, everybody in the symphony here does other things, and I was used to that growing up. Like everybody here, especially just because of the way it works in Hawaii. Uh, does more than one thing um, and you know I think that's it can get very zoomed in on the continent and in some of these jobs and so I had enough teachers there and I think especially with um, with Jesse and, and Martin Bresnik who were kind of encouraging me as I was going into more of that orchestral training like hey keep keep thinking about what it means to have your own voice and be creative and, um, and make space for that um, so that's something that I really advocate for with my own students and, and different ways that when I was teaching to, to get them to, at all ages to be creative with writing things. And, yeah. I'm going to ask this more pointed than Iggy did. Uh, <laughs> at what point did you decide, realize, come to terms with that maybe an orchestra career in a viola section wasn't the path for you? You know, I realized in retrospect that I stopped taking orchestra auditions when the Honolulu Symphony folded. Um, it was really that. I don't know if that's a. <laughs> that was not the answer I was expecting. That was not the answer you were expecting. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I always kind of thought like, oh, if I'm going to be a musician and like eventually yeah. come home, then I'm going to work in the symphony and I'll probably teach and I'll do this other stuff and I'll, you know, like that'll be what I'll do. And when the symphony folded before, I thought, well, th that's not an option anymore. And maybe this isn't really what I want to be doing anyway. So why am I doing it? You know? Yeah. Um, and I didn't realize it so clearly then. Yeah. But that was absolutely the moment when I stopped taking orchestral auditions. So, um. okay. <laughs> so you must maintain a symphony to keep. I know. Right? I know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. No pressure. No, no um, pressure. <laughs> so, I, before we get back to your life, so you went to places like New York and Germany. At the same time, or maybe later, mm -hmm. your sister Nava went to India. Yeah. And this is such a versatile. Uh, um, family and, and and she went to India to study uh, Hindustani music. Yep. music so tell us about this this uh, this family of yours where <laughs> where you you decide to learn from 
all parts of the world. Yeah, I mean, I, I do, you know, Nav Navahine is a, such an incredible musician. Um, uh, she was one of the eight artists that was featured at Shangri-La in that 8x8 yeah. uh, project that they did early. Was that earlier this year? It was the very end of last year, maybe. Okay. Yeah. With the the extended mm -hmm. the extended year that is. Yeah, exactly. Yes. <laughs> yes. It was in the past. In the, in the extended twenty twenty. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, yep. She um, she studied ethnomusicology, and she's a really beautiful cellist and composer. And so she spent a long time in in India studying Hindustani music. And I I do think that a lot of that kind of I, I can't speak for her, but is similarly just kind of how we grew up just kind of being immersed in playing and working with different instruments and, and just kind of having that be a normal part of creating and being as a musician. But. Great, so back to uh, you creating a, a composition. Um, so you have a, a great website that I invite everyone to, to, uh, to browse and your music is very creative and uh, it's more than just like tonal. I mean, there's so many mediums, and, and but what I found that even though you use so many mediums, it, it's very cohesive in the end. Thank you. Um, of course, there's a lot of viola uh, because that's your <laughs> instrument. Uh, but it, it, there's, a, there's something very strong about your music, I, I find. Thanks. Um, and uh, on the on a satellite level, you have some techniques. Tell us a little bit about shake, stutter, and scratch stops. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so This is not the core of your music, but I just thought it was interesting. Oh, of course. Um, as a kind of offshoot of what I was doing in my, in my um, doctorate, I was working with this composer, Andrew Norman, um, who anyone that has that has talked to me for long enough has uh, doesn't want to hear about him anymore. But I, um, <laughs> uh, Andrew is a, a beautiful human being and composer and uh, teacher um, who's currently teaching at Juilliard. He was at USC for a while, um, and uh, I wrote my dissertation about his string trio, uh, the Companion Guide to Rome, which, if you haven't heard, is a absolute masterwork. Um, I've probably listened to it because of the dissertation more times than anybody else, but I never got sick of listening to it through all of that work on it. Um, and Andrew specializes in these different sounds. And so as a part of that, I was thinking for this thing, you know, I wrote this big paper, but I was thinking I want to do something that's useful for other musicians because, and Andrew and I were talking about it, you know, when you play these new pieces, often there's not necessarily standardization and there's all these different symbols and it's confusing and you know if you're working with an orchestra you might only get a little bit of time to talk to them and so you know it's it's usually like oh actually that's a typo that's an f sharp and this and you don't really have time to physically show them um, and so we were just thinking what would it be to have this more organic thing which is it's not the only thing out there but but um you know garth knox has a really beautiful website. Um, Ken Ueno has a really beautiful catalog of his vocal techniques. You know, there's different people that do different things. Um, but I decided I was going to make a catalog of his techniques so that if somebody was playing um, his, like, his incredible um, piece, Play, which is his first symphony in, in all but name, um, that, uh, uh, you know, that, that the concert master <laughs> could could you know have a roster of all these techniques that were videos that were more organic, like what we would do if you were coaching a quartet, and you'd be able to, you know, if I didn't understand what you meant, I could get up and I could see what you were doing on the other side of the instrument, and it was more organic as how you would teach. You wouldn't teach by only ever watching one angle. You would teach by being able to walk around or turn around so that you could see the physicality of it. Um, and so the website shows these different weird sounds, um, but also in cases where it would be helpful in a lesson to see different angles, it also shows those so that you could use them. Um, so that felt like a, something that was useful for, hopefully useful for musicians, um, and not just you know a, a kind of writing out right. in a way that nobody would ever read. <laughs> so 
Shaken, not stuttered. It's a reference. Yeah. <laughs> I want to, I... I feel embarrassed talking about myself so much. No, no, no. But you, I, sh you shouldn't be at all. You guys are awesome, um, so... <laughs> so, being a, a young composer, you touched on on something that, and I'm going to talk about the symphony a little bit now because that's that's my uh, that's my job. Um, there is not enough opportunities for young composers to go through that experience that you're talking about. You know, yes, technology is wonderful, and you can put your scores into Finale or Sibelius and and hear a computer generation of what would sound like but you know we've started investing time with the symphony uh, this summer working with some young composers and actually uh, next week I think we're actually reading uh, one of one of your pieces with the symphony uh, in one of our rehearsals and you know it, it is it's it's so rare and um, you know I think about ballet companies that spend hours and, and days and months rehearsing together um, that's not something we do in the symphonic world. Uh, you know, football teams, I understand, practice a lot together. They don't sit at home and run into a wall or whatever you do. Um, you know, they practice together. And I just, I think that's so, it's, it's interesting for us to finally have this room to offer that to the young composers. Iggy, are you excited about something like that? Absolutely. Um, <laughs> it's... Exciting because we feel that we are part of the creative process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So of course the root of the creation comes from the composer. Um, but it's something new that we haven't played. You know, the, the music will be in front of us. And we might have practiced our own part at home. But we're only part of the puzzle. And the, the whole puzzle is the whole orchestra. And I believe uh, Tom Osborne will be leading the orchestra. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it, it's... Um, it's exciting because also you're with the composer, you know, it's not someone who's um, <laughs> lived in the 18th century, but uh, so it, in the presence of the living composer and excited because they're hearing the piece for the very first time live, you know, like you said, mm -hmm. it's not through the computer. Um, so it's just something we need to, to, to expand. It's like you're, if you only like use I don't need eighty percent of your lungs, and uh, you need to be able to kind of ex expand your lungs, and uh, that's part of the creative process. And uh, I think it's essential. Yeah, I'm th I'm thrilled to hear you uh, say that, uh, and I think that one of the things that I'm hoping we're able to do, and we're, we've been able to do it this past year through this show, uh, amongst other ways, is that we can take the audience on that journey. That that you know. Uh, a piece by Michael Thomas Fumai does just does it just doesn't appear in a few in in his case it appears in a few <laughs> days um, and it's a masterpiece uh, but it is really it's that artistic process that I hope we can continue to peel back the layers of uh, to really show you know how how and why this is relevant this this empathy that you spoke about so eloquently at the beginning of the show here you know why this is important um, it's not a passive experience that. It being engaged in arts and culture, um, it, it's something that you know we're all very much a part of. So um, I don't know how we got on that, but um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> and you you see how powerful that is with an orchestra like the the LA Phil yeah. that's really invested in Andrew's music, for example. Um, it's just so different, and I you know I seeing them play his music is incredible and it's so physical his music is so much about physicality and the actual people on stage and what it means to be performing on stage and and so it's it's totally different to hear live um, but also the orchestra has gotten to know him because he was at USC for a while and um, and is from California um, and so especially with um, and, and the way that Gustavo conducts his music and was so dedicated, there's certain things where the conductor is supposed to stop at the end of the piece and it's metaphorically a part of the piece. And there are certain conductors that won't do that, even though it's in the score. And, you know, to have somebody like that who's really dedicated to taking it all the way makes the performance so much more powerful. And, and I think that's also for the audience. It's not just self-serving. I was at... Um, 
a performance of the revised version of play in LA because I happened to be out there for some shows. Um, and so I stayed uh, an extra couple days so I could go to this performance. And I was so excited about it. And I, um, you know, I, I had a, a nice seat and I was, you know, behind some other lady. And I could tell at first when the composer came on stage to talk, this woman sitting in front of me was just so annoyed about the new composer. She didn't want to hear the piece. She wanted to hear the second half. She was looking at her program and kind of making a bunch of rustly noise and really annoyed by the new piece. And you could see throughout the first movement, she was drawn into the piece in this really incredible way, so much so that by the middle of the piece, when there was something quiet and some people came in for late seating, she was annoyed by them because <laughs> they were interrupting the piece because she was so mesmerized by it. Um, and, uh, and then in the last movement, this couple in front of me actually started holding hands. This older couple was started holding hands at the point when the whole orchestra actually finally comes together, <laughs> um, you know, formally in the piece. Mm -hmm. And it was so interesting because it was just seeing these, these people that were not necessarily theorists um, you know, having these different experiences of, of really kind of shifting the way they were drawn into the work and getting these emotional, big, formal things in the piece subtly. Um, and that's absolutely, I mean, it's, Andrew is brilliant, but also the LA Phil and Gustavo Dudamel, you know, were really dedicated to, to that, big. yeah. C can I ask both of you a question? So you're talking about uh, Los Angeles and, um, you also lived in New York, um, uh, uh, Dave, you found your niche with the Haymarket Opera Company uh, featuring operas from the Age of Enlightenment. So you could argue that those are specific niche, but how would you convince markets such as Hawaii where people may think, oh, we just need to play, I don't know, uh, Beethoven 5, um, but how do you convince us? You know, there's more to it, and there is a market, and there is a, a niche, and but more than that, you can entice audiences to be enthralled by all these performances. I, I mean, how do you kind of peel the kind of stereotypes of the top 40 and, and just try to get in, uh, a little bit open your palate? So I think about when we, you know, this summer we we took some chances with our programming. And, and I would argue that over the past year and a few months, the pandemic year, we expanded that repertoire through through the digital performances we did. We were able to start and it only takes it, it only takes one positive experience. And I think the Florence Price that we did. I'm not going to name names, but I, there were so many people who came to me and said, holy cow, why have we been not, why has this not been performed? This is phenomenal music that's been overlooked. And, you know, they're not all going to be winners. They're not all going to be, you know, the Florence Price Symphony Number no. 4. But I think that if, you know, we, we use that as a building block and, and then we connect two other pieces to that and, and we take our audience on this journey um, and we don't, we don't by any means forego, you know, doing all of the masterworks that we Bread love. Mm -hmm. um, but we have to look at those pieces when they were performed originally, when they were written and what was happening in the world. What was the inspiration for those pieces? And if we talk about that, uh, and, and use that as the centerpiece, not that those are great works, but they, they came Texture out of, yeah, they came out of this cultural or social experience. Um, then I think we have the ability to do the same thing with, with any piece of music um, and tell the story, you know, the story from that perspective or, or new perspectives. Um, you know, as we go forward here, uh, you will say this much more eloquently. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to say a little bit controversially, like, who is our audience? Yeah. Because, you know, th that's, and that's not to, to isolate anybody, but just kind of thinking about it. It's not necessarily about the, the piece. It's about how you bring people in. And 
that was, those were Michael Fumai's notes too, right? About Florence yeah. Price. Mm -hmm. um, are they still up on the website? Yes. Um, uh, Michael wrote these incredible program notes about the symphony, which if you, if you don't know about the Florence Price Symphony, I encourage you to read his program notes um, because this is also about storytelling and we have such a rich history of storytelling here and there's, you know, being able to tell those stories is dynamic for people and 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 that's exciting you know the story of it is is what draws people in and then they're able to hear it um and and um and that's a, another thing that just kind of going back to this idea of precedence you know it, precedence is so so important and and showing um that that does exist opens up this space for um, an imagined future that is an expanded audience, that is, you know, that is inclusive of, of those things that's not um, through storytelling, that's, that's actually more inclusive. Um, when I think about programming and you know, having the conversation around programming, I think the, the question that I always start with is, whose, whose story are we not telling? Mm -hmm. What's missing? Who's missing from the table? Um, you know, I'm not concerned about alienating an audience by performing Florence Price because I'm so confident in our orchestra to elevate that music to the expectation of a Beethoven symphony. And then we have these experiences as audience members where we go, oh my gosh, Florence Price. And then you tell everybody about this experience, and then again, I think we can we can build off that. But that, you know, it's really it's it's asking who's not who's not being included in what we're doing um, that I think will lead to being a more reflective organization and a more reflective uh, orchestra. Well, and I, I think also it's it's the universality of stories mm -hmm. and whose stories get to be universal, mm -hmm. right? Um, the the tragedy of some of the universality or the the kind of the the stories we usually tell as universal are not the only stories that could be told and i think there's a there's a lot of universality to that story of finding the florence price symphony you know everyone can relate to that of of losing a loved one and and going through boxes in the attic um, and discovering this uh, memento that you might not even know what it is, but it's so important to you and it has this rich, rich story behind it and that it evokes smells or it evokes uh, images or it evokes sounds to you and this, this little thing that belonged to someone that you lost. Um, and so the story of, of Florence Price and that symphony and how it was found, and, and that's a little bit of a spoiler alert, but please go read Michael's program notes. Um, you know, that's a really incredible story about how to discover it. And I think, you know, the more we can have great ed educators like him and opportunities to share those stories in a way that makes them universal is really powerful and allows then the orchestra to speak through the excellence of the, you know, the playing. Because we do have such a great orchestra. It's, yeah. Um, Lili Hua, just a couple minutes, but uh the music of Florence Price, the music of uh, Lei Linghua, Lanzi Lai, um, your concept of, of, of cross-cultural ventures. So sometimes it's not just a, um, you, 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 you have partnerships with uh, fine arts, visual arts. Tell us a little bit about, about some of your recent work. Um, well, one of the partnerships that's been uh, really, really powerful is um, the the Noguchi Museum um, that I'm working on a, a new project with now that maybe I'll save for another time, but I, they've commissioned me a few times to write pieces in response to the artwork um, and, and, and actually get to play some of the sculptures um, and the openness with which the, the staff there were so, um, you know, open to letting me do that was was really wonderful to just have people that are encouraging that are saying of course you can do this you know go do do it you know and and i um i was of course really careful but i 
I didn't feel that I was established enough to be doing that. And but I, at the same time, when I was composing, just felt so clearly about my voice and what I was doing with those projects that um, I'm I'm really grateful to Dakin Hart and and that team who um, that that's the curator who who I've worked with there um, for pushing me honestly to keep going out and finding my voice in a more extreme way. And the more I really did more of what I wanted to do, the more it kind of response it got. So I think that was a, that's been a really incredible partnership to work with them and, and be in a museum space with a Absolutely. different community. And um, yeah. So. Looking forward to discovering more, much more of that. Thanks. So we need to answer the quiz question this evening. So the correct answer is? Mana Ola Yap. And we, uh, we had a winner. Uh, Barrett was our winner. Um, no last name. I'm, I'm assuming it's Barrett Hoover. Um, if not Barrett Hoover, I'm sorry you're not getting this bottle of wine. We'll <laughs> correct that. Uh, but uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate it. Oh, no. Thanks for having me. It's, no, it's, it's very enlightening. Incredible to be sitting here with both of you in Hawaii Theater. <laughs> Who would have thought? Yeah. Yes. So make sure you get your tickets for the upcoming performances here. Even with the increased capacity, uh, we anticipate we're still going to be near a sellout for all the performances coming up. Uh, and the performances with the Liliuokalani Trust, the music uh, for and by the Queen, it is going to be phenomenal. I've, I've seen some archival footage of a, a previous education performance that we did in collaboration with them. And this is such an, an important story that needs to be told uh, to a larger audience uh, outside of Hawaii. And we hope that this can be a, a vehicle for doing so uh, with this project. So please get your tickets for that. And we look forward to seeing you at the Shell. And thank you so much for your support, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.